<laughs> All right, it's my uh, great privilege to introduce uh, Sandy Rosenblum, who uh, taught here in my early years of teaching here as well, then went to University of Arizona from 1990 to 2012, and is now back where she belongs, right here <laughs> in Austin. Uh, Sandy, as you probably know, is an absolutely preeminent uh, writer, uh, publisher, editor, uh, researcher, uh, and a starter of things new uh, in the field of environmentalism and planning. Uh, she always was and always will be. Oh, I'm just going to read this um, official lease stuff here, and then we'll be ready. Uh, Sandy's a professor at the CRP program here. She was the inaugural director of the Innovation and Infrastructure Program of the Urban Institute. DC-based nonpartisan think tank. Is there such a thing? A nonpartisan think tank? <laughs> she was the principal investigator of a two and a half year project addressing New Orleans stormwater issues, funded by the Serdner Foundation and the Blue Moon Foundation. The project won the 2014 National Green Building Council Award for the most innovative green infrastructure project of the year. The project was designed to bring U.S. experts on green infrastructure to uh, stormwater problems in New Orleans and to take major New Orleans stakeholders to cities across the U.S. known for their green infrastructure approaches. And I think that's more or less what we're going to hear about today. Uh, it is. And, and Michael just told me I only have 20 minutes. No, you have 40 minutes. <laughs> well, but 20 to talk and they get... 20, 20 uh, okay. All right. So, of course... So I'll start going I'll just <laughs> and I'll just ignore you. This is sort of funny to have <laughs> the screen behind me, and I even brought a laser printer, a laser pointer, but obviously it's not going to do a lot of good. So I wanted. I, I was told that uh, talks in this series are bless you. Our talks in this series are supposed to be provocative, and this is this is evolving work, and I do, and I do t I'm trying to be provocative, and I'm trying to provoke landscape architects, civil engineers, and planners who work in a lot of areas but don't actually work together and sometimes work at cross purposes. And so to give you a little hint about my answer is that green infrastructure, the evolving concept, requires cooperation and coordination, meaningful cooperation and coordination and partnerships with all the professions and all the agencies and nonprofits that are involved. It has to be meaningful. And it's not green if you're just planting plants or recycling. It has to be a major approach to all facets of the issue. So let's see if I can move this forward. So this is the new, the evolving new green infrastructure paradigm. It's come out of my work. It's come out of a recognition. In, in some ways, the Environmental Protection Agency has started to create it by its requirements for water discharge permits. I'll talk about that in a minute. And I last semester used this new, uh, last year at the, uh, in the spring, used this, this evolving paradigm to look at city infrastructure decisions that are not what you would typically call, that you would typically think of green, such as police, fire, solid waste management, um, sanitary water, things that planners often don't study, civil engineers do, and they have an advantage over the planners and the landscape architects because they've been studying it for a long time. They have a lot of experience. They have big books full of warrants of what you do in each situation. And we come along and say, you should be green. Well, you know, we're there saying you should be green, and they have all these volumes of books. And so that, that we have to break down those silos. So the new paradigm focuses on behavior trying to induce or sanction behavior that isn't green, and green economics, using financing, using money, which talks to get people to behave green. Also addressing inequities in the delivery and the finance of infrastructure services, ensuring that there's partnerships between the gray and the green, that they don't work independently, that they work together. 
that institutions work together. A lot of the emerging green paradigm is agencies, separate agencies being incorporated. The leaders in the country in green infrastructure management are those that have, for example, like Austin. You may not feel so, but Austin is one of the leaders in the country in green infrastructure management. And one of the things they did is put all the water departments together. There were separate departments for wastewater, for stormwater, for different things. They put them all together. It doesn't automatically mean those people work together, but when you're in the same building and the same offices, it starts a process. And a really important part of the new uh, infrastructure paradigm is involving stakeholders in evaluating service, in making infrastructure decisions, in evaluating the quality of the service that is delivered, and even involving them in service delivery, co-delivery of services. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the impetus for my work, as Michael indicated, was when I was the head of the uh, Innovation and Infrastructure gr Group at the Urban Institute, that's what I left the University of Arizona for, we partnered with a local foundation, the Greater New Orleans Foundation, with funding from two major foundations, the Serdna Foundation, which some of you may know as Andrus, spelled backwards, and there's a major Andrus Foundation that looks at uh, aging issues and a uh, southeastern regional foundation called the Blue Moon Foundation, and they don't capitalize it. It's a small b and a small m. So they funded us to go to New Orleans and address their stormwater problems. And by stormwater, I don't mean when the levees broke. They, these people have had problems for 50 and 60 years when it rains. Everything floods, all the low areas flood, even some middle class and wealthy areas flood. Tremendous damage, tremendous health risks from that flooding. And we were looking only at what happens when water comes down from the sky and causes destru destruction. As part of this project, we looked at who was doing innovative stuff. And we identified cities, and we held a series of five workshops in New Orleans where we brought people from those innovative cities, Portland, Milwaukee, Philadelphia. We'll put quotes around that. Some of you who are uh, landscape architects will have a deep reverence for Philadelphia, which is not actually deserved. Um, and there are people, there are cities that are doing really innovative things in the United States. We also took a body of local stakeholders, including a lot of city council people or their senior staff, to various cities around the country. And this allowed me to do a couple of things. I was often talking informally. We always took the locals out for dinner or for lunch. And so I was always talking to occasionally an engineer, occasionally a landscape architect, occasionally a planner. And what I saw was a huge gap between the formal presentation they put on, which was all pretty and lovely and everybody loves each other and we're all getting along, to reveal the underlying tensions. The civil engineers had no faith whatsoever in green infrastructure. The landscape architects and folks who believed in green infrastructure had no idea what <coughs> the volume of the, of the problem they were addressing, and the planners were trying to sort of bring them all together. And, and I learned a lot from that. So for those of you who don't know, briefly, stormwater is a result of increasing urbanization. As you build on land, you stop water from being absorbed into the ground. The natural water cycle is either the water is absorbed into the ground, it evaporates, or it gets reused. As soon as you concrete everything, and we know that in Austin, anybody who's been in Austin a long time knows about the horrible floods, the Memorial Day flood of 1981, where um, Dan Rather on CBS News was in front of a picture of cars in trees. The water came so high from Shoal Creek and Waller Creek coming together near downtown. And in, in, the, in the jazzy area where Whole Foods is now, there used to be car dealerships. And it broke the windows of all those car dealerships, and 310 cars ended up in Lady Bird Johnson Lake. And some ended up in trees. The water was so high that it actually, and oh, 300 cars and a baby grand piano, <laughs> which was in one of the dealerships. So, it, but what a lot of people don't understand about stormwater is if somebody was forcing you to drink either storm water or water from a sanitary sewer, drink the sanitary sewer water. All it's got in it is organic pollutants. What storm water has in it is 
heavy metals, oil, all kinds of organic and non-organic waste, bacteria. People put dead bodies, de ca animal bodies, all kinds of horrible things go into stormwater, which is basically not treated. It's just left to be in ponds so the heavy stuff falls out. They do not put chlorine in stormwater systems, and that stuff goes right into the water. It, and, and the flow of the water, which comes very fast, destroys streams, hurts aquatic wildlife. It's really bad. And the biggest problem is that most cities in America until very recently did not have stormwater fees. You didn't pay for taking stormwater, and even if you did, it was a flat fee. If any of you looked at your utility bill, you pay the same thing that a McMansion pays. It's, there's no relationship between what you're doing on your property to stop or not stormwater and what your bill is. So you're not, people who are bad are not penalized. People who are good are not are not given any reward for being good. Well, cities that have sanitary and stormwater systems, whether they're cities west of the Mississippi tend to have separate ones, separate stormwater and separate sanitary sewers. But whether they're separate or they're together, the city has to get a discharge permit to dump the effluent or the result into federal waterways and for, uh, under the Clean Water Act. And for 20, 30, 40 years, nobody was enforcing that. And what was happening is the water was going into the waterways, but it wasn't meeting federal and state water quality standards. And usually that's because the water came so fast that nobody could do anything with it, even the sanitary. They just had to open, the, open everything and let it run out. They couldn't treat it, it came so fast. Well, the Obama administration moved against cities not in compliance, and basically that was every city in America, almost every city in America, except, of course, perfect Portland, were not in, <laughs> were not in <laughs> compliance with, with, with the requirements of the act. And when everybody added it up, every single city found out that they were going to have to put out multi-billion, billion with a B, right? So suddenly, there were some uh, landscape architects around and said, hey, you know what? I could solve your problem. You just use bushes and trees, and, and we'll show you how to stop water. And so suddenly, cities, particularly well-known <coughs> as Philadelphia, said, OK, we're not going to spend $2.8 billion to fix our gray infrastructure. We're going to plant trees and gardens, and they become known for that. The problem, and, and there, there are a lot of true believers. But the, federal, but the EPA also is spending multi-million dollars to evaluate. They're, they're looking at what's coming out of various taps. And the, the bad news is it's not going to work if work means you're not going to have to spend <coughs> $2.8 billion. What Portland has, has concluded is that green infrastructure cuts your cost by about 10 or 15 percent. But that's not trivial if you're talking about $2.8 billion. And what Portland and the cities that are, are innovative have found that these things have to work together. So the traditional approach to stormwater runoff is just keep building gray infrastructure. You keep generating the water, keep building more more pipes, more pumping stations, and don't do anything about the causes. Don't tell people, hey, look, you realize what's happening here? Or charge them. You know who the biggest polluters are in this business? Parking garages. Because most stormwater fees are based on the amount of clean water, a percentage of the clean water that comes into your facility, how much clean water comes into a parking garage. So those people were paying nothing and contributing really serious, not only the volume, but the junk that was in the storm water the, and parking lots. And people are just not paying. And also, cities, particularly west of the Mississippi, were allowing development in very susceptible areas, as Austin did. We let people build out in Onion Creek, even though it, the, it had a huge record, a 100-year record of horrible, horrible floods. So as soon as the EPA started saying, OK, you, we're not going to allow you to, to discharge if you don't deal with these bad overflows, everybody started adding these green approaches that many of you who are landscape architects will know. Uh, disconnecting your downspouts, harvest rain barrels, harvesting, putting in rain gardens and bioswales, green roofs, street planners, 
making parking lots porous, not just asphalting them, putting in trenches. And I have a few pictures because they're not actually not very good. What, what this shows is they took, they don't, they're not dumping the, the runoff into the sewer system. It's being used to um, water the plants or that's a rain barrel hidden behind there. Uh, I th this is a, a, a suburb of Portland and one of the things the engineer from, um, who came to talk in New Orleans from Portland said is, you know, this looks small and a lot of the, he was a civil, he is a civil engineer and he said when, when the landscape architects wanted to do this, you know, they all rolled their eyes, which they still do, and, and like, what's this going to do? Well, it turns out that all those houses around there had basements that flooded every time it rained. Now the basements don't flood, and those people are not picking up the phone and calling their city council people. So this is a great success. It doesn't cost much. It, does it solve the, did it prevent them from having to spend $2.2 .2 billion on their gray infrastructure? No, but it's part of a solution, of uh, a, a set of solutions. Green roofs, street planners, porous pavement. And I'll tell you another thing about porous pavement. We have very strict impervious cover laws in Austin. Can you put in impervious pavement? No, you cannot. And the reason is, even though the city uses it itself, the reason is the maintenance issues are very great. The city can pay for maintenance. It doesn't trust you to maintain it. And I will tell you that Philadelphia and some of their official stuff on, on their program have a picture of a bunch of row houses with rain barrels in them. And we asked them if we could get to, s in people's backyards, if we could get to see them. And there was some embarrassment. It turns out that half the people disconnected them because the trouble with rain barrels is they're full when you need them to be empty. And a, and a, a, a landscape architect in Milwaukee said to me, you know, rain barrels are an entry-level drug. We get kids involved, we have competitions to paint <coughs> rain barrels, and then we teach them reality. Then we teach them what they have to do to be productive, to be part of the solution infiltration trenches. So this is what the new, the emerging green paradigm. So the problem is in the middle, the gray and the green infrastructure. And you notice that tiny little triangle? That's really the only place where those professions were overlapping in their efforts and, and talking to one another. They weren't. They, were all, they all brought skill to the table to address these problems. They were addressing them separately. A lot of them had never been in a room together before the EPA mandates, before they started to force green infrastructure. They hadn't talked to one another. Now, I already told you stories. There's still a lot of eye rolling here in Austin. There are engineers, you know, clearly forced to do this stuff that they don't think matters. But over time, you can see it matters. Not $2.2 billion worth, but it makes a difference. And, and green infrastructure has a lot of other benefits bef besides stormwater. I want, I want to talk about trying to get to a much more expanded <coughs> little triangle in the middle, which I consider the new green inf infrastructure paradigm. So in that paradigm, sh all stakeholders pay their fair share of the costs they impose on the system. So if you're a parking garage and all that horrible water runs off, you pay your fair share and not a percentage of your water bill. There are a lot of system inequities. Where do you think it floods in most cities most of the time? In the rich neighborhoods? No. The fact that there's flooding going on is capitalized into the price of the house, brings the price of the house down, so poor people live there. And they suffer every year, every time there's a heavy rain. Their garages flood, their, their uh, basements, if they have them, flood. The green paradigm says all stakeholders have to be involved in decision making about what infrastructure you're going to have, where you're going to put it. It facilitates co-delivery. By co-delivery, I mean when you put a rain barrel in or you disconnect or you do something that stops rainwater, you, you, you reuse gray water, or you put your um, landscaping water on a separate um, a meter, you get smart meters, you are in fact co-delivering that service. You're helping the public provider do what that public provider is supposed to do. A lot of this requires interagency agreements. You have to go 
watersheds go over jurisdictional boundaries. It requires a lot of jurisdictions to come together. It's really, really important to educate the public and stakeholders. In stormwater management, a lot of people don't understand that everything you put in a stormwater is not clean. So people pour paint down stormwater drains, they pour turpentine, they put dead animals in, and they don't understand. And you may have seen in some places in Austin where the stormwater drains are marked. I mean, that sounds sort of silly, but it turns out that most people didn't understand what they were doing. And sure, some of them are going to keep doing it, but a lot of them, when they got educated, go, oh, I didn't realize the terrible things I was doing. And we ha the green infrastructure paradigm requires not letting people build on sensitive or susceptible land. And Austin has led the country in that. And, and every time they pass a new law, of course, you know what happens in Austin. Um, there's a hundred lawsuits and the aggrieved real estate development industry goes to the state legislature to hope to get them to overturn it and we've been lucky. We've been very lucky in Austin that most of those those requirements on, are on the book and they're kept. So paying your fair share, that means being clever about how you set fees and you make sure, and the most common way to do it is to set the fee based on impervious cover. So a lot of cities actually do <laughs> GIS and Google, and they look at the amount of open land you have versus the impervious cover, and your fee is based on that. <coughs> Most don't do it yet on residential property, but they do do it on. Um, so when Philadelphia did it, for example, the, the water bill of the University of Pennsylvania went down 90%. Because they're a leafy green campus, most of their stormwater wasn't going anywhere. It was staying on campus. But they were paying a stormwater fee based on their water bill, a percentage of their water bill. Parking garages, on the other hand, went up from nothing to huge amounts. And that caused political furor that if we have time, we can talk about. So there are ways to do it. And there's, it, when you, development, it, you develop imposing stormwater fees so that development pays for the cost of any stormwater it, it does, um, merging departments, changing regulations, all of these kinds of things are part of the new green infrastructure paradigm. And the next step, of course, is all of this. Educational campaigns, making sure you involve stakeholders in rating services, evaluating, dealing with inequities, engaging with, with users. But here's where I I took it last semester in a more provocative way. I had a class that looked at police and fire, libraries, solid waste management, and wastewater management. And we applied the green paradigm to these services that you probably never thought about. And it didn't always work well, and it was, it was a, a barrier for the students to get into. But once they did, they got really excited about it because it provided a consistent way to evaluate what the fire department is doing, what the police department is doing. Not that they necessarily saw it this way. And we did this for the city of Pflugerville. Some of you know that last year, the Center for Sustainable, De our Center for Sustainable Development did a number of projects through classes in Pflugerville, and so we did one too, trying to show uh, Pflugerville how they could incorporate green things. Interesting, they had, they had some things that Austin didn't have. They, they in fact have, they're smaller, so they have a little bit more freedom to be innovative. But here's some things. If you provide households with free smoke detectors, that's co-delivery of service, right? Buying smaller Fire vehicles is addressing a whole host of other things, using volunteer fire departments, contracting for fire de fighters, uh, all sorts of institutional innovations. A lot of, uh, we have out in the adjoining areas of Austin a fire service district. A lot of cities buy their fire, like Pflugerville, buy their fire service from a large, they don't have a fire department. Um, contract arrangements where you come to each other's benefits and adopting land use that says, OK, if we can't pay for the fire stations, this is a big thing right now in Austin, right? They didn't put the new fire stations into the budget. But part of that is that they didn't make the developers pay for it. So there are areas which have, Im have imposed impact fees for fire stations. And you can't impose impact fees for services only for building the fire stations. But still, and buying trucks, that would help. Um, police whole bunch of things that are, green, are really part of the green infrastructure 
uh, paradigm. Police are starting to charge for a lot of services they never provided before. They, they, they provided for free, like funerals. Have you seen funerals going by? The cops are leading it. Now they charge for that. Going to, to high schools, they're now charging school districts and they scream, <laughs> you, we always provided it for free. Well, what, what do we know about, what's the lesson of the commons? What, what do people value about free services? Nothing. <laughs> people misuse and abuse free services. They don't take them, they don't seriously consider whether, if, you, if you're going to give it to me for free, I'm going to take it. They're hiring civilian employees. A lot of cities, for example, all the, guy, all the guys and gals who are giving you tickets when you park, those are civilian, not, not uniformed officers. A lot of, uh, the whole business of supporting um, your alarm system is part of co-delivery of services. And a new one that you might have heard about, you know, Ring and all those things, there are cities giving them out to, for free to citizens because it turns out it actually does Im lower the crime rate. Well, we don't know if it actually lowers the crime rate or if it just redistributes it to communities that don't have the ring, but you don't care, right? You're not on the phone calling your city councilman. Describe the ring a little bit. Haven't you, have, you put it on your front door and it, and it like really? A it's a camera and it's yeah. linked into your cell phone and your computer and I actually think people who have it are a bore. Uh, friends come to visit me, oh, thank you God know. I have it. Yeah, <laughs> I would never think yeah, that yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I had friends visiting from 1,500 miles away, and they're looking who's coming to their front door 1,500 miles away. You know, they're on the phone all the time. But it, it, but then you can. But the thing about ringing these things is you can talk. So if there's somebody, you haven't seen any of these commercials. So if somebody is sneaking up on your house. You say, hey, guy, what are you doing? And you can be in New York and they're in San Francisco. And they go, ah, and run away. Plus, they have, if they actually do anything, <laughs> well, the cameras are usually up high. So they have to come prepared for it. And criminals usually go to the easiest target. So if they have to bring paint and cover the, they okay. go to some other house. And there is, in fact, data that show that this does reduce crime and that means the cops aren't out at your house about a burglary when there's a drug ring three blocks away. It really allows them to efficiently use their resources. The citizen watch and tip lines, those are part of co-delivery of services. Community policing, that's part of co-delivery of services and again adopting consistent land use policies that don't let doesn't let development go on if there's no money to build police stations and buy new cars and and again you can't use it you can't use impact fees for services but you can cover some of those infrastructure costs Wa wastewater systems increasingly they're they're finding ways to do fees that actually measure the real wastewater you're putting out as opposed to what you're watering your lawn with and even though we're not supposed to water our lawn that much, at least the w when you water your lawn, it's, that's part of the natural water cycle. It's either being absorbed or evaporated. It's not running off and causing those problems. But we've never had a real effective way to charge you for that. Well, the city of Los Angeles allows people to put in separate meters for their sprinkling system. I suppose you could hook your hose up to them and run it into your house, but I mean, why? And, and, and gray systems, which are, you know, people can't sort of deal with that, but there are cities outside the United States who've done very well with reusing gray water water, shower water, and not toilet water, but shower water in the washing machine and so forth for um, the lawn. And uh, flow controls, you know, the, the waste system will come out to your house and put a low, low flow uh, shower head and low flow toilets. Uh, they give you rebates if you put in a low flow toilet as opposed to a high flow toilet. Um, I don't think they've gotten over the fact that you have to use those twice <laughs> to, to get the efficiency <laughs> of the old ones, but we won't go there. And increasingly cities are, are allowing or adopting smart meters so that you can see, oh, if I put my dishwasher on, set my dish, the timer on my dishwasher to go off at 1 o'clock in the morning, the rates are 40% of what they are at 7 o'clock. And then once people get that information and get set 
either they read the meter or it gets sent to their smartphone. They make behavioral decisions. We have a lot of evidence of that. And all of the things they're doing with solid waste management, incur making people pay by the volume, technically we do. Some of you may live in apartment buildings and not know that, but if you live in a house, you pay for the size of the containers you use and you have to pay for the extra bags if you need more. And that causes people to think, and it's also, a, some of these things very much address the equity issues because when you use average pricing, you're always advantaging rich people. Rich people use more water, they flush their toilets more, they throw more stuff out. If you're using average pricing, you are unfairly pricing poor people who aren't using the services as much. And on top of that, it, the average city is providing poorer infrastructure services in poor neighborhoods to begin with. So a lot of these solutions address the equity issues. So this brings me to where I hope the green, the new green paradigm is leading us, to a much bigger interaction between landscape architects, civil engine among landscape architects, civil engineers, urban planners, and other professions, that the area where we are together looking at these infrastructure issues is much bigger, and we're really, really cooperating. We don't just do reports and email them to each other. We're in the same room. We're talking to each other. We're learning each other's language. We're, we're explaining to each other. We're dealing with issues. One of the big issues with traditional green infrastructure, meaning plantings and things like that, is maintenance. Big problem. And that has equity issues. One of the features of the Philadelphia plan that everybody is talking about is Philadelphia has a long culture of garden clubs. You know, rich white ladies going out and planting gardens, and there's some and it's, there's some beautiful ones that are in fact helping to control stormwater in Philadelphia. And these ladies go and weed them and take care of them. Well, what's happening in a poor neighborhood where people have to have three jobs to pay their bills? You think they're down weeding rain gardens, and th so there's a r or or pulling the weeds out of the permeable pavement? They they have to make a living. They have other issues. Doesn't mean they don't care. It means that they can't. And so we have to, and it had never occurred to some, in Philadelphia we saw it, it had never occurred to some of the landscape folks that there was an equity issue here where the city was giving money if, if a community would adopt a set of green infrastructure. But poor neighborhoods weren't queuing up to get the infrastructure in their neighborhoods because they knew they couldn't maintain it. And they also have extra pressures on them, right? I mean, it's not, it's not just that they don't have the time. I mean, that, those, those neighborhoods are underserved anyway. The infrastructure is poor anyway. So they're starting in a hole. So all of these things have to be addressed with all of us together. And I'm going to give a seminar in the spring where we try to take this further and we try to build on this. Um, I think it has value. I mean, some people have said to me, oh, that's just artificial. You just draw, you know, you've got a scattered plot of things and you're drawing a box around it and calling it the new green stormwater paradigm. And to some extent that's true, but those, those dots actually are becoming more connected because the people associated with the dots are talking to one another and understanding one another and meeting with one another for the very first time. And, and there's some really interesting things going on that are of relevance to all of the disciplines, I think, in the school. So I'm sorry I ran over 22, uh, well, no, 20 gosh. minutes because you talked for two minutes, so. <laughs> <coughs> well, let me speak slowly. <laughs> <laughs> no, you went very fast. I, I thought you had 40. Is there anything else you want to add? You just say something. Uh, don't. You did, but you have but I know, but I'd rather mm -hmm. answer questions all unless right, you are, s unless you all came for the free lunch and can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're open. The floor is open for questions. Go. My, so you know, I don't have a, own a parking garage, so I don't know what they might be paying. But my stormwater fee for my house is tiny. Yes. And I would think water fees in general, not just stormwater fees, are so low that they actually can't really affect. People. That's right. So it turns out that, a ho but that's because that's an old fee. That's not part of the new paradigm. I didn't say Austin was perfect. Portland isn't perfect either, but they're moving toward that. So Austin, in fact, ha doesn't mess around much with residential property, and that's largely, they say it's because it's hard to tell how much impervious cover you have at your house, and that's sort of semi-true, but it's really a political thing. 
So most cities that are on the, for, uh, in the foreground of this issue have complicated fee schedules for commercial and industrial properties. So if you ran a business, you would see it. It would be big. And so you don't protest because it's tiny. And, it, and also, in Austin, the residential stuff, the way they did it in a lot of places, they just added up all the land, the impervious cover in residential use, figured out on average what it cost to serve that, and divided it by the number of water meters. So it's, you know, it's a silly thing. But it's better than nothing. Seriously, when... When the Obama administration mo started moving in 2010 against these cities, the vast majority of cities in America had no stormwater fees at all. So Philadelphia learned the hard way. If if you don't do the nose, if you, if you don't do it slowly, right, the public outcry is amazing. So what happened in Philadelphia is a lot of people's rates went up a thousand percent. Just stormwater rate. Just the stormwater rate, and y you know, and they. They were like she deer in the headlights, right? Because they had done all this publicity, but nobody believed them. Number one, because you know who who believes their city officials, and and number two, nobody had any idea until all the machinations were done how high their bills were going to be. And you had a, you know a pen that used to pay hundreds of thousands, University of Pennsylvania that used to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year now has an eighty-three thousand dollar water bill, right? So a month, so. That money has to come from somewhere. And in an abstract way, it's perfectly fair that you, your water bill went up 1,000%. But that's not politically feasible. So they had to backtrack it. And the city uh, passed a law that said that your stormwater rate could not go up more than 10% a year. So it's going to be a long time before their rates get close to being able to affect behavior. And they were surprised about that. They expected people to go out and do all these green things, put in gardens, disconnect, put in, uh, they expected businesses to put green roofs on. But once the law was passed that your bill couldn't go up more than 10 percent, that took a lot of the um, sanction kind of behavior. So then Philadelphia started paying people to do it. They started giving big grants to businesses. And they started small, and nobody took them up on it. And then they raised it, and they raised it. And they really had to give businesses real money to put uh, green roofs on buildings and disconnect and uh, hold water on land. I mean, it's some of you who are landscape architects know this, but that lovely lake in, in Mueller, it's a retention pond, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you can do that kind of stuff if you have enough space and so builders started doing that and people like it people like looking at a lake right and ducks come and all that stuff so uh, but it turned out that it the the negative wasn't enough to change behavior and remember we're talking about green behavior and green e economics so my guess is that even were Austin to try to raise that rate they'd have to do it really really slowly you know when I talk to normal people uber and Lyft drivers um, uh, retail salespeople, um, the guy who drove me home from the car dealer the other day, they all talk about how high taxes are in Austin and why they're fleeing to the suburban areas where the taxes are less and, and housing prices are lower. I mean, this is a reality. Um, so I don't want to be the typical academic offering a perfect solution that nobody's ever going to implement. But I still think that it's important for planners and landscape architects be thinking this way, to be offering those ideas. And then, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. So if you insist on having a perfect system, you're never going to get anything. You have to do it slowly. And hopefully we will get those fees to a place where people, st a lot of people who are not just greenies, right, but people who look at their bill and go, damn, I got to do something about all this water running off my property. And education helps because so few people in the stormwater area have a clue what's going on. The, it's, it's the stepchild of the water business. If you look at articles written about it, there's almost no articles written about stormwater management. There's some engineering texts. And in the United States, almost nothing non-engineering is written about handling stormwater. And, and it's, it's not a salient public issue. So it takes time to get it to be a salient issue and to get people from to stop pouring used oil down storm drains. I mean, there, 
It's a process. I have a question to follow up on that. Okay, oh, and then Jay. No, go ahead. Go uh, oh, I'll let Michael do it then. Go ahead. So you brought up the question of expense, and cities obviously are becoming far more expensive to live in, which is its own huge problem. And But you also brought up the fact that Portland has shown that this is cheaper in the long run, but it seems like there's this problem before we get to the long run where it becomes more expensive. It's right. Expensive stuff. You're talking about increasing, it I, seems like bureaucratic complications. No, they... Putting, it, like in the short term as things change and the expense of funding these new projects... Well, you have to. It's not a choice. You, the f well, I don't, I don't imagine this administration is spending a lot of time going after cities, but there are a whole bunch of cities that are being sued by their own residents because they, they're not meeting the stuff that comes out of the end of the pipes is too often way, way over both the sanitary system and the stormwater system. And, the, and even if they're separate, they're linked because they infiltrate one another. We can talk about that if you want. So the, the bottom line is these cities are being hit by fines that go by the day. So in a lot of cases, yes, our state governments too. So there's real money on the table to do this. Not so much $2.8 billion. That's a real problem, and cities are having to grapple with this. The green stuff doesn't, a lot of the planting kind of stuff doesn't cost that much. And the harder issue is to deal with the long-term maintenance. That's often not included in the cost. So these things are messy. But still, if you can stop a neighborhood of basements from flooding and the costs are not very high and you can get the locals to help you maintain that, you've addressed a problem that some city council people care a lot about because every time it rains, the so people who, on the phone. who pays for these interventions and how does that not get passed on to the taxpayer? Oh, of course it gets passed on to the taxpayer. So that's, that's the issue that, I'm, that seems But you know what? Technically, you do not have a choice. When they send you a bill, you have to pay it, right? So when the federal government charges you $10,000 a day because you have too many spills that are over standards, the bill adds up pretty fast, right? So you have some choices. You can go out and do what Washington, D.C. is doing and build three $1.1 billion tunnels, and that's what they're doing. They're doing some green stuff, but mostly the way they're meeting the mandates, and they get, of course, Congress looks over their shoulder more than it looks over Detroit's, let's say. Um, it's not like, gee, let's do these green things. It's We have all these costs coming at us. We have to meet them one way or another, and it turns out that one way to lower the gray costs, which are very high, is to use green infrastructure. It doesn't solve the problem. You still have to do the traditional gray infrastructure. You just have to do less of it, and then you don't, you're not paying the feds. And it's technically possible for the feds or the states, it, it varies by which state you're in, whether the feds do or the states do it, that they'll pull your permit. You, then, you, then what are you going to do with all your effluent? If they won't let you, well, you can put it in tankers and take it down to Mexico? I mean, seriously, this is not a voluntary thing. You have to do one or the other. You have to keep paying the fine, and, and, and deal with lawsuits by your own citizens because you're not meeting the standards, or you've got to fix it. And, and a lot of landscape architects were all hot about this. We're going to fix the whole problem. No, you're not. But if you work together with everybody else and get civil engineers to open up their minds and work with planners and involve stakeholders, you're going to lower the gray costs. And you're going to get a prettier city, right, because the green infrastructure is generally attractive. So it's not a choice thing. The law is against you. You have to figure it out. And plus, do you really want your city dumping all that s s literal crap in the system? OK, Jake. Uh, how come Philadelphia is not all that? Because the two-thirds, the largest majority of the decision makers didn't believe it going in, and they'll tell you that off the record. They never believed that planting green things all over the place. They haven't upgraded their systems in 50 years. They're falling apart. There's no way you can, pl you can cover every parking lot with trees. You're still not going to solve 50 years so of they infrastructure. Were to do it all with green. Yeah. 
and they had to get an exemption from the EPA and there was pressure from the sustainable green movement who wanted to believe this. There was a lot of religion involved here, okay? So e the EPA said, okay, Philadelphia is going to be our test case and they're spending money to monitor whether it's in fact working. And it isn't working, it, it's working, it depends on what you think working is. Is it going to stop them from having what to spend business? billions of dollars on infrastructure? No. Is it going to lower the cost of the infrastructure, hard gray infrastructure? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. But they're not going to meet federal standards with green alone. And, and there, are, there are religious believers, there are landscape folks who, who believe that it will if you just plant enough parks. And they don't deal with the maintenance issues. And I mean, there's a real serious maintenance issue with green infrastructure that is not there with gray infrastructure. I mean, a lot of gray infrastructure runs on computers. Have any of you seen the movie Canadian Bacon? You remember when they raid in Toronto, they raid the power station, <laughs> and there's just two little old people there because it's all run by computers? That's not really so far off. A lot of these systems don't need a lot of manual labor. <laughs> Seriously. A lot of the, and that's why engineers like them, because they don't have to deal with people, right? <laughs> it, all right, over here. So on that note, is there any discussion of uh, kind of uh, urban green infrastructure conservation core, like what kind of happened in the 30s um, to create, I'm talking about job development, like where's the economic Yeah, so pa p um, Philadelphia's got a big thing about jobs and, 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 the, and, par and they gave money to people to train um, at-risk youth and we went out and saw a bunch of those projects and if they're lucky when they finish they're going to make minimum wage and they're going to be pulling weeds. So, I mean, one, uh, a job is better than no job, but there, you know, and, and there's a lot of talk about green industries, but the, the green infrastructure stuff is hard manual labor, and that's being automated too. I mean, all the sprinkler, have you ever gone by a place in the rain and the sprinklers are on? That's because it's automated, right? And, it, and when you call up and complain, what they tell you is, Sorry. they tell you, it's cheaper to, to, to keep it raining than to send a guy out to turn them all, to turn all the computers off. Now someday they'll systematize it and they'll be able to do it, but that is a big problem. There's not a lot of high-end jobs in that sector. So yes, Philadelphia talked about it. People do talk about it. Uh, Milwaukee has done this wonderful thing where they have the, what they call a water lab and they've dedicated a whole, they've remodeled a whole old building and anybody who's doing anything innovative in water, private people or, or nonprofits, um, could get space there and could get grants. And so they've been the hub of a lot of water innovation and they're supporting graduate students at all the universities around there. So are they creating jobs in a way and they're, but you know, some of them, it'll be a while before they hire a vast number of people. Most of them are only getting by because they're being subsidized, the rent's being subsidized, and, and they're getting grants. And this is all good, and they may discover some remarkable new thing, but the majority of jobs in that industry are not, the best you can say about them is a job is better than no job, but they're not great jobs. Um, so the cities that you talk about are U.S. cities, and they are doing a lot towards advancing this argument of green mm -hmm. versus gray. Um, I guess I just feel like that's all relative to ourselves, and I'm curious in your research how we, as America, compare to the rest of the world in this. Well, like everything else, we're more wasteful. We use more water per capita. A lot of um, European countries have smart have had smart meters forever. Um, they they mandate and sanction behavior we don't have the political will to do. Um, they do a lot of um, well. I mean Rotterdam is famous for that, and there were a bunch of Dutch people in New Orleans, and and the problem was that what they wanted to do was tear down the the the, the levees and flood the lower ninth. And in one sense, that's exactly what they should do. But, you know, 
I mean, that, you know how, much, how, much, how many gazillion dollars they spend pumping water out of the lower parts of New Orleans and in so doing keep it sinking more? It's the fastest sinking city in the world. It, boom, it, it sinks like three inches a year, boom, 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 boom. And then that makes more catchment for rainwater that they have to keep pumping out, even as they have a clean water shortage. So that's what they should do, but we don't have, and, and, and Roger, there was just a, a PBS special the other night on what they're doing with, oh no, it was on, on 60 Minutes, did anybody see it? What the Dutch are doing, they're, they're buying land up from people and just flooding it. You know, that is, pro but, but you know that the head uh, of the uh, New Orleans Reconstruction, who is a planner, a Berkeley planner, got fired because the obvious thing is not to let people move back to areas that are constantly flooded. But there are historic areas, and they're largely African-American areas, and the politics and the, the optics of that were horrific. Those people want to go back, so you know we have to keep building bigger and bigger dikes. But in fact, or levees, in fact, the Europeans are on the cutting edge, partially because they're more centrally managed. They just tell people what to do. Um, I've done work for governments in Europe and in Australia, and I'm amazed at what, I mean, they're democracies, but I'm amazed at what they tell people to do, you know? And it's like you, you're not allowed to use your washing machine in high-rise buildings in some German cities after 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> can you imagine? I can imagine a building management having that rule, but I can't imagine the city telling everybody in the city they can't run, run their washing machines after a certain hour at night. And I bet Juliana has other stories, too. It's just that we have different political regimes. Gray water, that's, we, it's not gotten very far. Do you know what gray water is? Re I sort of said it before, reusing all that water? We just are so squeamish about it. A lot of cities, a, a county on the border, um, of, uh, south of Tucson on the border, did allow some gray infrastructure, allowed developers to put in two systems, two water systems, a totally clean water system and then a gray system, and the developer couldn't sell the houses. People, they were, they, it's new, they didn't understand it, they were terrified that they'd be drinking toilet water, I mean, just, or, or do you see the signs on golf courses, for example? What do the signs at golf courses tell you about the water? and do not drink it. And in fact, you should wash your shoes and stuff because that's tertiary, usually tertiary water. You potentially could drink it without harm, but you don't know. And we're very squeamish about that. We've gotten away with using that kind of stuff on golf courses and parks and, you know, the city uses it. But people, and that would be a wonderful thing to do, but, Europe, but all over Europe and Africa, they're doing that kind of stuff, and we just can't get our heads around it. Michael, there's question. somebody in the back? Go ahead. Introduce yeah, so um, a couple weeks ago during the, the senator's debate between Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke, um, Ted Cruz criticized Beto O'Rourke for instigating a higher rainwater tax in yeah. El Paso. And he said something like, I don't even know what that is, a tax on the rain? Which really made me think, like, <laughs> how little are politicians thinking about this? Well. I think our politicians think fine about it if what they want to do is get reelected. People don't like taxes. People don't like charges. And cities like ours that are so innovative and, and cutting edge, there are a lot of lower and middle income people who aren't on board with that either, and, and they, they voted their minds. I mean, if, if you're just getting by in forty or $50,000 a year and your water bill keeps going up and your, all these bills keep going up, all you think about is waste and what am I getting from it? And it's not stupid for Cruz to say that. It's correct. Well, I'll show my feelings, but I think it's, cor cor it's courageous for Beto to have done that. That's the right thing to do is to price things so people don't treat them as free understand the impacts of their behavior. Again, the new paradigm that I'm, that's being created and I'm putting boundaries around is all about gr green behavior and green economics. And they go together because for all the greenies that there are in the world who do it because it's the right thing to do, 
the majority of people do it because it costs them not to do it. But if you haven't already been taxing them for it, it is so hard. It is so hard, and they don't think it's fair. And also, if you're redistributing costs, an economist friend of mine who's gone now once said to me, when you hear people bitching and moaning about, oh, the poor people are going to have to pay this, these taxes, they really mean, I'm going to have to pay these new fees and taxes. They don't give a damn about the poor people. They don't want to pay their fair share, and they're not. In, in all of these related services, poor, get poorer services, pay more for them as a percentage of their income and often as a percentage of the cost of service. Police, fire, all of those things. And so when you hit middle class people with the bill that represents what they really cost, they vote you out of office. I mean, you have to look at the political realities too. That's why you really have to start small. Get it in and then you can raise it. And still, you can't, you know, eventually the frog jumps out of the boiling water. So it, it's hard to titrate it. It's hard to know what a community will stand. And, but one of the things that's been um, in the cities that have done it, Milwaukee is not Portland, right? But Milwaukee has made some significant strides. And more and more people have come on board as their basements don't flood every spring. They see positive results. But then there's the negative results. You know, one of the things that Austin is doing is, a lot, is uncovering the creeks. That's a big part of green infrastructure, right? And allowing natural vegetation. Well, one person's natural vegetation is another person's weeds. And the city knows there are phantom mowers. <laughs> there are private residents who take the riding mowers and go out to the creeks. I'm not making this up. The city will tell you this. And mow down those natural grasses because they don't they see them as weeds. And they, they see think they're doing a service. They, they think absolutely they think they're doing a service. Again, that's part of the education. That's part of and it's hard. And and when you talk to city officials anywhere also they go they're riding. Yeah. <laughs> well, Milwaukee has this, one of the things Milwaukee does, I like Milwaukee a lot, they're very practical. One of the things they urge people to do instead of rain gardens, I mean they don't have anything against rain gardens, is put lawns out, put a lot of lawns out. And, and you go, lawns? Well, it, but lawns are part of the middle class mindset. And everybody ha has a mower and they don't mind mowing their lawn. And lawns help a lot, right? Not as much as a rain garden would, but they do absorb water. They do hold it till it evaporates. They do allow you to use, reuse rainwater. And if whole neighborhoods get lawns and, and their parkways, or what do we call them here? The mm -hmm. medians on the other side of the, we call those medians oh, really? They're not medians. Yeah, we, in, in LA we call, I can't remember what we call them anymore, but you know, those, gr those help a lot. They have a lot of things, bicycles, and you know, there's a lot of ways you can use them. And people will keep them up. Remember I started with the story of all those beautiful rain barrels in people's backyards in Philadelphia, and then when we wanted to see them, they'd all disconnected them? Because they're a hassle to keep the mosquitoes out. You have to really work at it. And as I say, they're usually full when you need them to be empty, because you get a rainy season, and what the hell are you going to do with the water? And eventually, you, it ends up back in the storm sewer, because you have to let it out. So. A lot of this is education, a lot of it is understanding what the problems are. And so Milwaukee says, hey, we would rather have 80% of the people with lawns than 10% of the people with rain gardens that they don't main ultimately don't maintain. And that's a really interesting response mm -hmm. to that problem, too. But here there's a huge anti-lawn movement, but it's because of drought, I assume. Yeah, and I lived in Tucson, so, you know. No lawns at all. I mean, if you put in one patch of green, your neighbors sent you hate mail. <laughs> so, um, but that was that was partially the green, but it was partially the way water worked in Arizona. Then in Tucson, we paid almost four times as much for water as they do in Phoenix, and you can tell the difference just by flying in. You fly into Phoenix, and you see swimming pools everywhere. Modest middle-class houses have swimming pools, and that's a result of low water fees. People aren't paying for, they grow rice. They flood the desert and grow rice in Tucson. Can you imagine? Or in, in near Phoenix. Um, but in Tucson, we're also, we were also much more green, and so 
barely saw lawns and if you so I had to I didn't want a lawn but I put in lemon trees in my backyard and it took a lot of water and but I hid them behind my 10-foot adobe walls because otherwise my neighbors would you know burn crosses on my non lawn maybe maybe one more question I want to ask if you can say something about what you think about larger kind of semi-green infrastructure such as infiltration for instance Oh yeah, I mean Houston does that. So Houston has this huge, and they're going to be interconnected of uh, parkways, and what they really are, of course, are parks and parkways and bike paths. But when it floods, that's where the so those are um, detention ponds, and uh, and and they have I can't remember they have the largest system of that in the United States. So the water when they get a lot of rain. About the bayous. Yeah. yeah. The, the, it's not a perfect system, but it actually does reduce a lot of flooding, not in big, not in horrific historic storms, which we're getting more of, but it, it, it works. And so people are doing regional park systems. A lot of the regional parks you see, if you're not a landscape architect, you probably don't recognize that what they really are is, is detention areas for stormwater. And um, people do occasionally drown in them. That's a problem with that mixed use kind of thing. And pe you know the famous LA River have you ever seen been in I mean that's just cement right and people I played in it when I was a kid but when you get a heavy rain people drown in them because they're not used to them going from nothing to 20 feet of raging water and you know from public service announcements that two feet of water will move a car so you know you don't want to be there but there are a lot of interesting larger projects and a lot of regional stuff and I and I, and I know we're finished but there's a lot of institutional stuff that's interesting that these cities have done, uh, partnering with um, a larger regional water authority and taking their storm water to a regional authority through pipes so that small cities don't have to deal with it. They have to deal with the piping and the gray infrastructure and the site-specific green stuff, but they don't have to, you don't get 20 l systems taking care of the water. You, get it all to one regional system, which still, of course, has to have a discharge permit and has to watch the quality of the water that comes out. At that, I'm going to just remind everyone that when we close at 1, there's 15 or 20 minutes more of people just doing a smaller conversation. But Sandy, thank you for an absolutely wonderful talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming.